Uh, my name is Kwadi. Um, I'm excited here to introduce this next panel. And the topic of which you might think is a little bit of a mystery because not much on the website. Who here has any idea what this panel is about? Great. And yet you still came. So that's awesome. That is amazing. Uh, I can't tell if you just need a place to sit or what, but we will proceed with some very interesting content. Be primarily because this topic is very interesting, right? We're talking about hacking medical devices, hacking critical hospital infrastructure. As you can see, all the great work that's being done in this village next door about keeping patients safe. And that's really the key uh, thing we're going to talk about today. And when we say simulation, simulation comes in a lot of different flavors, has a lot of different definitions. But if we think about it, uh, we're really talking about what could happen to patients that are connected to these devices that are vulnerable. Uh, how can we study that ahead of time because we don't want to be discovering it after the fact, right? So we have to use the critical tool of simulation, whether or not that be high fidelity simulation when we train doctors or whether or not it's going to be simulating attacks in, in different environments so we can better understand and learn them. So that's enough of my introduction for the topic today. I'm going to go ahead and start introducing some of our panelists. Um, Dr. Uh, Saxon, uh, who is listed to be on this panel, had a family emergency this morning and actually has flown out of uh, the state. So apologies to anyone who wanted to come for Dr. Saxon, but she sends her, uh, her regards. We're going to go ahead and start off. Uh, we have Dr. Julian Goldman at the end. They're all each going to give their in own introductions. We have Dr. Suzanne Schwartz. Yeah, it's Suzanne Schwartz. <laughs> and we have Mr. David Guffrey. An excite. Please mention my name again. It was <laughs> They'll now proceed with their own introductions. I'm so sorry. Listen, I went to public school, and I can't spell anything. So these are. This is, please forgive me. Yes. Yeah. It's the anesthetic. Please. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Okay, so it's been given away. The secret is out. I am, I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, I work at Mass General Hospital. And I'm also the medical director of biomedical engineering for the Partners Healthcare System. Uh, in 2004, I started a lab working on medical device interoperability and a few years ago added cybersecurity to our portfolio. And we have a lab in which we have no patients of either kind. Uh, and uh, we, so we have a, a simulation environment, we have a, a sandbox uh, in which we can look at uh, different scenarios and what the clinical impact might be if either a device or if a part of a system uh, is affected. Our work has been supported uh, mostly through federal grants, um, including work supported by the FDA. Doc, doc, so when Dr. Schwartz is uh, passed on, uh, the mic is passed on to her, um, we've been collaborating closely on medical device cybersecurity and also with other agencies. Uh, in order to provide information and resources, um, education, knowledge, uh, and work together as a community to address what we know is a, a serious threat uh, and uh, to avoid um, any negative effect to patients. And that could happen if a device is affected. It could happen if a device isn't available. It also could happen if, if incorrect information is disseminated to clinicians and it overwhelms them. So, you know, like any complex ecosystem, uh, it's really difficult to address all the issues. But we're working with a, a lot of uh, collaborators and trying to do that. And we're really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you, Julian. So I'm Suzanne Schwartz, and I'm at FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. I work uh, as the director of a new office as a result of a reorganization, the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation at CDRH. And it is a pretty expansive portfolio that we have within this office, all extremely exciting, leading edge work, uh, which makes every day an extraordinary challenging, but again, uh, intellectually, scientifically stimulating and exciting uh, portfolio. Included within that portfolio is medical device cybersecurity. Interestingly enough, um, my background, I'm a clinician as well, I'm a physician. My training um, has nothing to do with cybersecurity. I'm a burn surgeon actually, uh, and uh, prior to coming to the FDA, what will be nine years ago uh, in October, I worked both within the clinical and academic sphere as well as sometimes spent in the private sector as well, working within the medical device space for a startup technology uh, company. 
But when I came to the FDA as a medical officer, uh, I was placed within CDRH and uh, was involved really in the pre-market side of review and consultation on submissions of new technologies that has to do with my field, burn injuries and wound repair, really exciting. Um, as a result of, long story short, as a result of the work that I was doing, I was introduced to the field of what's called emergency operations and medical countermeasures at FDA and uh, was assigned to really represent efforts on behalf of the center for public health related emergencies. And when we were struck several years ago, this goes back to 2013, with the presentation of vulnerabilities of medical devices to the agency and really we're not sure what we were supposed to do with that information, especially when it comes in as a huge package of information um, through the researcher and through the Department of Homeland Security. The agency had made a decision at the leadership level that it's within this public health response role that we would undertake efforts for medical device cybersecurity. So what started out, the point here is what started out is purely reactive and response subsequently evolved and morphed into a much more proactive forward-leaning stance. Um, and it took really putting together a team across the center of experts uh, that rep really, really represent the entire product life cycle. But beyond that, it was really about recognizing what we lacked. And that's a really important point. Um, for our discussion here, because it's recognizing that there is a lot of expertise, knowledge, resources that the agency did not have and still does not have with respect to medical device cybersecurity. So what do you do in that set of circumstances? You reach out. You collaborate. You look for partners. You look to understand exactly what it is that we need to be working on together as a community in order to address some of these really complex challenges and this evolving space. And it's really as a result of that over the past several years that we've come a significant distance. We still don't make any mistakes. We have a long, long way to go as an agency and as a community, but um, and it is uh, an arduous journey. Um, but it's through the types of com collaborations and partnerships that we've had uh, through your community, through the hacker community, with industry, with healthcare delivery organizations, with patients, with others, that has brought us to where we are right now in articulating policy guidance in uh, defining collaborations and understanding what are ongoing challenges, and we'll continue to do that as time goes on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Guffrey. I'm the Biomedical Cybersecurity Specialist for Partners Healthcare. I lead the Medical Device Cybersecurity Program for Operations and Research across the healthcare enterprise. Background is kind of winding and varied, so I started out doing electric st electrical stimulation, feedback systems, and signal processing nonlinear and linear systems. Transitioned into doing virtual reality as well as brain computer interfacing and other kinds of sensory motor integration. Came to Partners Healthcare a number of years ago, was on the medical device integration team leading architecture development, medical device uh, integration across our enterprise with our health record system and overseeing cybersecurity as well as monitoring systems pieces for the medical device integration and a few, a few years ago have transitioned to this current role leading the medical device cybersecurity program across the enterprise. So I work organizationally across all of our sites, all the different information systems groups, as well as our clinical groups, biomed groups, and conduct research in the medical device interoperability cybersecurity program lab that is co-run co with Julian Goldman over here, who is our medical director of biomedical engineering, and in conjunction with our chief information security officer, we do a lot of work across the organization for both operations and research within the lab, and we'll talk about some of those activities here today. Give it up, what a panel, huh? I'll just keep it for a minute and pass it around. All right, I'm waking up. I think we're gonna talk about a lot of serious problems today, right? We're gonna be talking about some of the big difficulties that still remain in the space, issues of patient safety, et cetera. But before we do that, I think it's important for us all to take a little 
uh, history lesson, if you will, and look back at how far we've actually come. So being involved in this space for, for several years now, I remember first coming to this and thinking, wow, everything is broken. It's a giant dumpster fire, right? How many people have heard that? Like healthcare, cybersecurity, medical devices, a giant dumpster fire. You know, I don't know how raging it is right now. I mean, there's probably some varying opinions. Could you still roast some marshmallows? Probably. But I think it's important for us to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane. I'm going to ask each of these panelists to just reflect briefly on how far we've come. Uh, please, if we can start. And just talk about how far the space has come. What have you seen in the last 10 years or so that gives you some hope about what we've accomplished before we just tear it all down with the negative stuff? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, regarding how, how big the fire is, is it, and is it uh, only sufficient for roasting marshmallows or, or what, I think put into perspective that uh, when we talk about uh, medical device cybersecurity, we have to kind of think about whether, which part of the system we're talking about. Are we talking about a device itself and devices being affected? Are we talking about man-in-the-middle attacks of data that might flow within a health system? Are we talking about, for example, uh, ransomware of, of health records? And probably the answer and where we are with that differ depending upon which part of the system that we're talking about. Uh, but I think before, you know, just even before digging deeper into that, and we'll all do that, um, I think um, everyone should um, have a small sense of comfort knowing that medical devices have always been imperfect and they've always have the potential for failing. I mean, that's what equipment does. And so the basic part of, of medical training, of, of clinical training, nursing training, biomedical engineering training is to deal with equipment that isn't performing correctly. Things break, they don't work. Um, and so depending upon the criticality of, of a medical procedure, there are backup systems in place and always have been. And as an anesthesiologist, for example, we've always expected that the anesthesia machine and ventilator will fail during an anesthetic. We always expect that our other equipment will fail. We've always thought that way ever since these things were developed and when they used to fail a lot more frequently than they do today. So the reasons for failure are different. They used to simply you know, be mechanical failures, pneumatic failures, and now that everything is microprocessor based, uh, we have to be more concerned about cybersecurity. But at least so people you know, don't uh, um, cancel the surgery that's um, scheduled for tomorrow or next week, um, be aware that uh, you know, failures happen. Now, we're not used to seeing large fleet failures of entire you know, products across the whole hospital, for example, which of course is the big fear with cybersecurity. However, those things have happened also completely unrelated to cybersecurity. For example, if there's a defect in the plastic tubing that's used for, for infusions of medication and you know, all that truckload of that defective tubing arrives, it's all distributed throughout the hospital, the next thing you know, all the pumps are affected. Um, there have been software upgrades over the years that have caused problems with medical devices, critical devices. So even that is not entirely new. Um, but I, in a sense, the vector and uh, the nefarious nature is what's changed probably the most. And so I think the end result of this is we're talking about it now. We didn't 10 years ago. We're thinking about it now. Um, and what we have yet to do is start to ensure that everyone has a higher level of vigilance uh, for cybersecurity related device failures and we need new ways of being able to address those when they occur. So instead of going on for an hour, I'm just going to stop right there. <laughs> uh, Julian, I'm going to pull on one thread that you mentioned because I think um, when I reflect on the past several years, I think a lot of it comes down to a significant change in culture, a significant change in mindset and how we think about cybersecurity. Uh, and what I mean by that as an example or illustrative of where we are now versus where we were several years ago is that in many of the conversations that we would have, FDA, whether it's with industry, whether it is with uh, healthcare delivery organizations, whether it's, you know, with, with just general public, it was, you know, kind of that can never happen. That's just purely hypothetical, theoretical. I don't need to be worrying about that. And how that would translate with respect to how even industry would view an issue that we'd bring up. It was like, well, you know, but we don't design our devices to be thinking about the potential malintent or nefarious intent. We're designing for intended use. So think about the shift in mindset that we've asked of industry 
in the design of new devices to be putting on the hat of the adversary, to be thinking about it from the standpoint of threat modeling. It's like, no, we need to consider other potential mechanisms by which a device could be used other than what it was perhaps, you know, in, in the most beneficent sense intended for. The same mindset shift was required of healthcare organizations because, and, and of providers, because all of us who work within this field, it's hard for us to wrap our brains around the idea that anybody would want to do anything bad. Um, and that why would you look to uh, disrupt operations within a hospital, the most vulnerable of individuals there? Why would you do such a thing? Nobody would ever do such a thing. But the recognition o over the years, first of all, that hospitals, you know, in, in some ways, they represent that they are a, a soft um, attack surface um, and they therefore have to be thought of as kind of a hostile environment in terms of attempts at attacks on the systems and CISOs of hospitals will tell you that that happens and that's been happening day in, day out, all the time that they're constantly trying to defend from attacks, attempts at intrusions. So when you think about the requirement of taking on a, a very different posture here, that means really moving to a different place with regard to what, first of all, FDA would expect of manufacturers um, in the design of devices as well as in the ongoing vigilance and management and monitoring of these devices throughout their lifetime and what the expectations are in not only in the monitoring but then therefore in attending to vulnerabilities that do get identified through the lifetime of that device so we cannot just ignore those or leave those but they really do need to be looked at, assessed, validated, assessed and determined in terms of what the potential is for a patient harm, for a safety concern coming out of that vulnerability were to be exploited. Um, so those are, you know, some prime examples of what, you know, at the very core, the very foundation is required in order to move the ecosystem. There needs to be a, an acceptance of changing that culture, changing that mindset. It is an ongoing process. I think that we've certainly seen a lot of understanding of this and buy-in from industry as well as from the hospital healthcare side, particularly again from CISOs that are on that front line where there's a lot of work that's yet to be done and I think that this will be a good also segue as we talk about today's discussion in medical simulation where there's a lot of work that has to be done is with the clinician community clinicians and patients as well, but clinicians who are, again, focused on treating patients and giving care and thinking about things in the most kind of beneficent manner. The notion that something can, uh, something, someone can impact on a device's safe performance and therefore considering the benefit risk calculus, understanding what that is and how to have dialogue with patients and how to also be on the lookout for that, that is a whole new world. And that's a, that's a world that, you know, uh, Christian and I have, have, we've talked a lot about and that is where we need to be thinking about as we go forward. Medical simulation offers uh, a real, you know, extraordinarily, uh, really excellent tool in terms of being able to do that, particularly because it's something that resonates with the clinician community. And, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. I would say where, where in my tenure, I, my tenure hasn't been as long in the field as the other two well-respected people next to me. However, what I have seen in, in this time frame has been an, a rapid increase in, con in connectivity. So medical devices now are not functioning as an island. We don't even have vendor systems individually functioning as an island. You have a system of systems that are connected together with, uh, you have imaging, you have clinical monitoring, you have electronic health record systems, you have laboratory systems, we have even R&D systems. They're all tied together in some manner all on our networks. And because of this rapid connectivity increase over the last number of years as a result of several governmental initiatives as well as other aspects that have gone into this, this threat surface is, is increasing with that and the awareness 
of cybersecurity and the need for cybersecurity is increasing in the medical community. We have individuals such as myself now popping up at other health institutions across the country where you're having medical device specific experts devoted to securing their systems within the healthcare organizations. We have procurement aspects that are going into, you're considering cybersecurity now as part of your procurement process. You're assessing your medical infrastructure intake into the company prior to deployment. And you're making recommendations and mitigations as a result of that. You're reassessing your existing inventory that may have been, your medical device may, systems may have been in operation for decades potentially, and you're looking at it with a new lens to see where are your potential weaknesses, how can you fill them, and where do we go for the future so that we can make better decisions. Awesome. So, of course, we picked the best of the best, right? The people most aware of this, uh, representing institutions that are very savvy when it comes to medical device, critical hospital infrastructure security, right? So, the best of the best, right? I'm going to ask a provocative question to the panelists here. Put, put on the hat of a uh, middle tier, somewhat rural hospital um, that takes care of 100,000 patients a year. So still takes care of a lot of patients but isn't connected to a big hospital network, doesn't have tremendous amounts of resources, et cetera. And take what you know about how hard it is to secure these systems, how vulnerable they perhaps could be, and answer the question, do you think that if a patient was harmed by a device that was compromised by a piece of malware or some other thing, that we would, that hospital would be sophisticated enough to detect it? I think that's a very tough question to answer. Where I would start with it is it depends on A, the monitoring infrastructure that they have, B, the relationships that they have with the medical device manufacturers themselves, and C, the technical personnel that they have on staff. So a, it's, this is a mid-sized hospital, not a small rural community hospital. So you can, you can suppose that they are going to have some technical resources. You are going to have some form of network monitoring. You are going to have clinicians that are going to be able to see changes in behavior of your medical infrastructure. And we have many manufacturers in the field that are on top of their game. And they are... Act, they will actively work directly with the hospital to help remediate and mitigate their risk. So as long as those relationships exist, I would think that you can, it's going to minimize the potential impact. I can't, it's, it's, I can't directly answer it fully. No, it's a hypothetical. Those are my favorite ones because you can't answer them. <laughs> um, I would... Um be pessimistic about the ability of such a hospital being able to recognize uh, a uh, cybersecurity related incident um, as being just that. Uh, and uh, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the hospital is not well resourced. It is in perhaps an environment or a location that is geographically well and well removed from uh, some of the you know, b bigger academic or bigger you know, clinical centers where uh, there is a lot more likely exchange and dialogue happening across uh, the C-suites and the operational folks within those um, organizations. And we've heard that, you know, we've, there's been an analysis really done of that uh, several years ago through the Healthcare Cybersecurity Task Force, actually, that kind of surveyed what does the nation look like with respect to its uh, current state of preparedness and capability, and there's a very wide spectrum uh, uh, across the United States for hospitals and healthcare facilities, which leaves us certainly very concerned about um, those types of facilities and how we as a collective, as a community, can bet not just government, but really everyone, the pri pri private sector as well, think about uh, the notion of partnerships and other efforts creatively that can help those types of institutions that may be, again, more remote, more siloed, less resourced uh, to assist when it, these types of incidents do occur. Thank you. Well, 
I think we, we should consider what kind of, of issue we're dealing with, what kind of attack it is. Is it something that's intentionally in stealth mode or is it something that's intentionally not? So if the, uh, if the Windows desktop screens pop up a ransomware notice with a very long, hard to remember uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, information, uh, I think he's sure the hospital is going to know that's been attacked. Um, if on the other hand um, someone is performing a man in the middle attack to modify uh, lab values and other data with an, an intent to assassinate someone or cause harm or disrupt um, operations, I imagine it would be very difficult for anyone to detect. Um, if a medical device is bricked, if the medical device obviously isn't functioning correctly, what people will do is grab another medical device, um, call their biomed department, clinical engineering department, call the manufacturer and say, hey, you know, this, this thing's a piece of junk, please fix it. Manufacturer might examine it and hopefully would identify that it was a malware related issue. If it happens to many devices as soon as they're connected to the network, um, I think the light bulb will come on pretty quickly that something isn't right. And probably most hospitals would, you know, one of the things they would do, of course, call the manufacturer and hopefully the manufacturer would know. And a lot of small medical device manufacturers aren't resourced, uh, you know, probably to f sort this out easily. There are a lot of mom and pop operations. Others uh, that are larger are well resourced, but they'll often call up uh, the FDA and they'll call uh, Dr. Schwartz and say, we got a problem. Could you help us out? What do you know? What, what's the, what does the intel look like? So I really think it, it could cover the whole spectrum and to some extent depends upon how stealthily uh, they're, they're intending to be. Um, hope, not looking forward to that day. There's a lot of talk about how we need to do a lot of technical work and process improvement from when a security researcher finds a vulnerability in a device to when they interact with the medical device manufacturer, interact with the regulators to perhaps when they put in mitigating controls, perhaps patches. I mean, we've spent a huge amount of the last 10 years talking about that process. Um, we're going to transition a little bit into talking about this uh, unknown part. Um, just to put a little bit of background out there. Imagine an implantable medical device needs a patch. This patch doesn't go over the air like your phone, right? It's not uh, a very easy thing to deploy. In fact, it almost always has to be deployed by a doctor in a doctor's office. Why, you ask? Eh, if it should fail, then the device won't work and you'll need a doctor or a nurse nearby to make sure you survive without the function of the device, right? Does that make sense? Well, you can many people out there who are probably new to this space in the medical device patching world can already understand how hard it must be to patch these things. If every time a, de a device has to get patched, you have to go see your doctor, it's a big deal, right? If now the question to the panelists are, how equipped do you think doctors and nurses, nurse practitioners, the clinical staff is today at A, understanding this and B, being willing to deploy something uh, like a patch, uh, knowing nothing about cybersecurity or patient care implications. So the question again, how well do you think doctors are prepared now? And then we'll get to in the future how we can maybe change that. That's a good question, an interesting one. Uh, th these things are happening already. We're receiving notifications that devices might be affected and we contact uh, specialty groups. For example, if a device, you mentioned specifically an implantable device, uh, but it could be something that's um, connected and not physically implanted like a, an insulin pump, right, which is, you know, similar in some regard, although it's not life sustaining, the pump itself isn't because someone could use an injection instead. Now, when we contact uh, our different physician groups and uh, others, uh, there's really no pushback. Uh, you know, they think they're used to being advised by other experts when it comes to technology and they ask what is the risk, um, you know, and they rush to find out if the devices they have are affected or if their patients are affected and then they ask for guidance on what to do. Now, I don't think we've hit um, times yet where uh, it looks like something has a very high risk um, if, if not addressed and a very high risk to the patient if addressed um, for the reasons you mentioned, you know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to destabilize something. If you have a device that's working and let's say is a very low risk that it will be affected as long as let's say it isn't not connected to something, if that's the case, then the, you know, the best course could be um, transparency, advise everyone and then make sure that you uh, monitor the situation. And, uh, you know, based on the experience to date, 
Uh, I'm finding very receptive groups of, of clinicians. Now, I'm an anesthesiologist, as I said, but I work in my role in biomedical engineering, work with all the other groups you know, across the hospital. And there's really been no pushback, but sometimes it, it, what, the guidance is not necessarily very clear when we're in the stage of uncertainty, which is usually that first stage. So I have a slightly different perspective. Um, having to deal with the responsibility uh, from the FDA of putting forward recommendations uh, through communication to providers, to clinicians, and uh, dealing with what one could consider a much more high stakes or high consequence type of uh, situation uh, where, uh, as an example that you know, Christian provided, it would be necessary for the, the physician to bring a patient back in um, and uh, have a discussion with the patient over what it is that's about to happen and why you know, the physician feels that it is a prudent step to take. Um, and we have seen a lot of reluctance, a lot of hesitancy within certain clinical groups, uh, within certain clinician communities. And the one that is most prominent, and I think it's because also it's the first one that we've really had to deal with, has been within the you know, cardiac space, uh, specifically with electrophysiologists. And I think that it's a demonstration of really where we are in you know, you know, the nascency and, and what will be the growing pains here as far as better arming clinicians with what we can anticipate in the future with respect to these types of devices definitely needing to be updated over their lifetime. Um, and taking that from the standpoint of um, oh my God, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is going to create a lot of anxiety and uh, concern and fear for the patient as well as for the physician to something that becomes more of the norm that a physician, you know, can expect that over the lifetime of a device, the device just like a phone or any other technology will need to receive updates in order to address the vulnerabilities that get identified later on that are not you know, known uh, or have not been discovered earlier on, that that becomes, and again, this com comes back to the shift in mindset and culture, like that this becomes, yeah, part of what the practitioner can expect, and therefore, what? How do we ease that level of comfort for the practitioner so that they also know how to have a discussion around that with a patient? Uh, so, I think that there is a, a lot of opportunity to, for us to talk about approaches that we can take to better educate clinicians to better inform, to arm them um, for these situations that we would expect are going to become more normal and that we're not dealing with a kind of crisis um, every time a vulnerability is discovered um, within a device that is going to necessitate the physician to take a specific kind of action. And I'll take it just a step back as well. Um, I don't think that at this stage for different uh, clinician groups, there's sufficient enough even understanding of cybersecurity to recognize with, with whom, with which patients they may feel the action or recommendation is appropriate and where they may feel, nope, it's not necessary for this particular patient and how to have that kind of benefit-risk related decision, uh, benefit-risk, excuse me, discussion in order to come to an informed decision. One has to have ample background and understanding of what the risk is and what the consequences are in order to be able to render that kind of a decision together with a patient. But we're not even at that stage yet. So simply handing over a set of recommendations or next steps to a physician without having more contextual understanding, I think, is right now a gap area that needs to be addressed. 
I'm in full agreement with, with uh, the other two panelists. I think that there is definite room for improvement regarding the educational process and communication process. So over time, there is going to need to be a shift that medical devices will need to be patched just part of normal course. Eventually, we're going to find vulnerabilities in almost everything. That's just how it's going to happen. Everybody in this room knows that. So those kind of conversations need to be starting to happen with the clinical staff. Now, that kind of piece can go into, well, how do you develop an educational structure within your organization, as well as how do we develop a national educational structure? And those two pieces, all, all three of us on the panel are actively working on, and there's a number of people in the room that are working on how do you put, put out information in a digestible manner without increasing the anxiety while improving the context and awareness of your device and its potential impacts and situations. Awesome. So we're going we're gonna to go a little bit faster through some of the next topics. Um, who here in the room would like to fly in a plane with a pilot who has never actually flown a real plane and let them take off and land? Please raise your hand. Where's your sense of excitement? Yeah, how much to take it? Uh, we could discuss that. Uh, we'll, we'll see where you're, how much you would pay be willing. You know, maybe $50 is not enough. Anyways, we're going to talk about simulation next. So um, we're going to have two different types of simulation. One is simulating attacks on medical devices. Uh, probably best exemplified for their, uh, their work at the partner's lab, right? So how do we simulate these types of attacks? How do we put clinical risk and the criticality um, of these types of things and see how they translate to impacting patients. That's one type of simulation we're going to talk about. There's also this other simulation which falls into the pilot part of it. So, you know, aviation figured this out decades ago that they didn't want pilots flying in planes the first time while learning to fly planes. So they put them in these high fidelity simulators, right? Like basically video games to teach them how to take off, land, push all the buttons the right way, et cetera. We stole that in medicine and we teach doctors how to take care of really sick patients using simulation. So who here wants a a doctor who looks like they're 25 taking care of them when they have their first heart attack. Anyone? No, never having taken care of a heart attack before. You probably don't, right? So we got to teach those doctors how to take care of those sick patients using mannequins and dummies and fake emergency departments so that when they give the wrong drug or give too much of a drug or too little, we can correct them before they do it on a real patient. Yeah, that sounds great, right? We did this for uh, for medical devices, right? So we took some real research out of the security researcher space and we wrote clinical simulations based on if this pacemaker vulnerability is real and it impacted the patients, this is how it would look. The patient would come in complaining that their pacemaker kept shocking them and perhaps they'd even go into a deadly heart rhythm as a result. Or maybe if the infusion pump they were hooked up to was compromised, it would give too much or too little medication. And we let these doctors go through these cases not knowing what was going to happen. It's kind of like Dr. Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like they unroll the scenario. I bring all that up to say, Dr. Schwartz, you saw some of these simulations in a couple of these conferences in the past. And what were some of the insights you saw? Did you see anything? Was it magical? Was it boring? What were some of the real importance to this that you saw that we could leverage to address the very issues this panel is talking about, which are generally clinicians and clinical staff don't know much about this and need to be better informed? Yeah, I, I have had now the opportunity, really the privilege to attend and to observe two such types of uh, summits uh, that uh, went through these types of simulations and for each of the scenarios, observing the clinicians kind of go through step by step their uh, interventions, uh, their uh, kind of watching them think through and act at the same time and then do a debrief afterwards and listen to their aha moments was just extraordinarily insightful and impactful uh, because each of them had said, you know, again, going into such a simulation, not knowing what the scenario was going to be, that the the consideration of a exploit um, of an attack never would have entered their mind, um, and it brings the understanding that this can occur into a frame of reference that resonates for the clinician, you know, in terms of what it is that they need to be thinking about um, in uh, dealing with a emergency or a scenario that's unfolding right before their eyes. 
Uh, and I, I think it was in some ways a, an awakening and an enlightenment for each of the clinicians that were involved in those scenarios. And uh, for me, very much validating that uh, in order to bring better awareness to cybersecurity for clinicians, placing a clinician in an immersive type of learning environment in the way that we do teach uh, and train medical students and house staff and so forth is, one, is a very, very effective method of doing so. Uh, because it, the intent is not, again, to turn clinicians into cybersecurity subject matter experts, but rather to give them the tools to be recognizing and to therefore be doing what they do best um, uh, as a situation is presented to them. And uh, it was, um, again, a very, very enlightening and informative exercise. Add something if mm -hmm. I can. So if, may I uh, add, so um, what's, what, is, what is called um, high fidelity simulation is what this is usually called in the medical education world. And a number of specialties now use these, these environments I go through simulation training every few years as well, and you know, boy, it makes you sweat. And you know, what, so what's special about simulation? Well, you can simulate things that someone may never see clinically, and you can control and contrive whatever you want so that it becomes not only that educational um, opportunity, but it also becomes seared in your memory. And then when there is an event, there's a problem, people usually fall back on you know, their most memorable events of, Oh yes, there was a simulation on this, and may maybe this issue is related to cybersecurity. You know, would be an, the outcome of that. Also, a big part of simulation is the team training aspect. It's it's learning what to do when when um, devices fail, things fall apart, um, and it's rec it's learning how to recognize that something is actually much worse than it first appeared to be. Because we've all had bad things happen. Um, could it be a fire in the kitchen, or it could be a car accident? And at some point, things look okay, and then they suddenly become terrible. And and we train clinicians to recognize that that tipping point, which is you know hard to do. You have to kind of step out of the experience and know how to bring in other help. So there's a lot of value at, at multiple levels um, for simulation and I think it's been really great to, to you know, go down that pathway because of the potential for, for all sorts of good things to come out of it. And you're of course welcome, Dave, to, to, to comment on that or I, if you'd like to talk more about your simulating of hacking these devices because the last topic I'd like to hit um, after you talk about that is really how do we involve this community in here because yep. there are hackers out there, right? We care about being involved in this. That's why they're out here. They are patients themselves or their parents or their kids are patients and they want to help but they don't fall under the, the traditional categories, right? They're not in academia. Yep. They don't care about writing papers. They want to hack. And there are a lot of barriers to hackers out there getting involved in this space. So please talk about your, your work in, this, in the lab and then also let's start talking about how we can broaden uh, inclusion into this space, which is really hard. You know, hackers can't get a hold of devices easily. They don't know who to talk to. There's a lot of problems and pushback and even threats from certain organizations uh, being involved in that. So if we can move on to that for the last topic. All right, well, I'll say one comment on the previous topic of one area in these various simulations that has been very en enlightening is learning who needs to be at the table. So when you're doing emergency preparedness and response activities and you're working through emergency situations, it's important to figure out what your communication paths are, who needs to be in what particular role, how do you all work together, you need to have people from the federal regulation level, you need to have people from your various groups within your hospital organization, you need to have medical device manufacturer groups, you have to have researchers at the table. And you have to, so all of these various pieces have come out in some of our simulation activities working through these kind of emergency disaster situations within our laboratory. As far as other kinds of more hacking oriented uh, research and uh, and activities that we've done in the lab. So we use uh, we use the medical device cybersecurity lab for a number of different pieces, both on the operation side and the research side. Operationally, we do 
penetration testing of, of our systems prior to deployment, prior to procurement. You work through your various systems and figure out how how you can work then with your organization and with your with your medical device manufacturers to f fill any potential gaps or figure out how can you have mitigated controls. As far we also have work under a project with the Department of Homeland Security. And this is an, a, an aspect where all of you in the room, I highly encourage you to join us in this effort. So this is under the DHS impact program. And if you Google impact, you know, it'll it'll pop up and we have a project for generation of medical device network traffic. And the reason for this is because as you have all experienced in this research community, you can't get a hold of, of easily of medical devices. You may not be clinical experts and know the clinical workflows and there may be other legal barriers to be able to do research on these medical devices. And because of that, there's a lack in our field of net networking systems and understanding of the medical network traffic in order to develop tools that we ha we have tools in the in our reg regular IT networks we have visibility we have detection systems we have artificial intelligence all these different pieces on our, on our on our IT networks we don't necessarily have access to that on our medical networks due to a number of different hurdles we are we are doing under this grant generating medical network traffic under normal state scenarios, failure mode scenarios, attack scenarios. We're bringing this to the research community so that you can then get access to this traffic and be able to start developing tools to help improve the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, that deserves a clap. Yeah, get, get the data. That's awesome. Build the tools. I just want to clarify, uh, when Dave said we don't we don't have we don't have those tools on medical networks. The we in this case he meant was the healthcare sector, yes. not we in not, our hospitals. Not, not partners. Yeah. Healthcare. So, the, the ecosystem <laughs> right. So the the very nature of how medical devices um, are connected in hospitals is they're typically on separate and proprietary networks for a host of things that relate to the fact that they were not necessarily designed to plug in to your um, you know backbone. Uh, they don't. For, I won't talk, you know, go into the technical details. It, um, but the bottom line is that they're typically isolated and separate. And that's why this is a data set that's been hard to get access to. Another reason is that med medical devices are expensive and uh, one needs a license to buy them unless you buy them on eBay, in which case you just need money. Um, so, and then as Dave said, setting them up requires a certain level of uh, clinical engineering knowledge. Part of the reason we set up the lab the way we did that's allowing us to share the data um, through the DHS impact program, part of the way we set it up was to um, answer a question of what does a laboratory sandbox need to be prepared for a cybersecurity event, a, a significant one. Uh, I hope, hopefully, not cyber Armageddon or whatever it's called. Uh, but you know, these things could happen, and we, as a nation uh, and uh, as a community, have to be prepared. So part of that work over the last um, uh, year and a half or so has been a project um, sponsored by the FDA um, in partnership with MITRE uh, to build a medical device cybersecurity sandbox to understand what do we need, what kind of tools, how do we simulate different hospital environments and different network architectures. Um, and different implementations and configurations of equipment. Manufacturers um, may dictate that for a device to work correctly or a hospital may have to dictate a configuration requirement based upon their available technology or clinical workflow, physical layout. Um, they may have um, antiquated equipment, networking equipment. They may have state-of-the-art equipment. And so we've been studying that for some time and built out the cybersecurity sandbox um, as part of this um, cybersecurity preparedness initiative. And you can see how um, there's really good synergy between these initiatives, whether it's DHS science and technology, s and program wanting to pr share more core data uh, with, the, um, with the cybersecurity community, whether it's the FDA um, in Suzanne's uh, office thinking about how do we prepare um, as a healthcare sector um, so that the community could rapidly engage, um, hopefully ahead of time, not in response, but proactively to these um, events. Do you have anything, Susanna? Oh. Uh, I would just simply add that I think that both the types of um, scenarios that we were talking about, whether it is the clinical simulation 
for, uh, for providers or whether we're talking about, again, the test bed or sandbox, it, they both demonstrate the power of simulation for preparedness. And um, uh, we always talk about the importance of you know, preparing, exercising, 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 exercise to failure, not to futility. It's the idea of before something bad happens, uh, let's play this out and understand exactly what our uh, weaknesses are, what are the things that we need to shore up, and then reiterate on that and continue to learn through that process. Simulation is a really powerful tool to do that. Phenomenal. All right, so we're uh, approaching the end here. I just wanted to uh, again thank our esteemed panelists and uh, leave perhaps a challenge to the audience and everyone here. We've talked a lot about simulation as a powerful tool. Let's practice, let's tabletop these things both to educate the doctors and nurses taking care of patients, to uh, talk about involving hackers into this space, but really I feel like simulation is a tool that can be applied across this community, right? And that's really something I'd love to see go in a different direction. Um, we'll continue to do clinical simulations, we'll continue to do the technical simulations, but what we really need is uh, involving more of the community outside the walls of a hospital, you know, tapping into the tremendous resources of all the hackers here uh, and allowing them uh, to experience what this would actually be like. Because what we want to do is leverage the expertise out in the room, all those hackers, to do meaningful work to help secure patients. And we talked about all the difficulties of how to do that and all the intricacies and how much you have to know to do that. Let's reduce those barriers, if you will, to allow more hackers into the community. And I guess I want to say thank you as well to everyone that's involved in the We Heart Hackers Initiative, the Biohacking Village Next Door. Please sit down and take a, uh, take a stab at the CTF, check out the vulnerable devices, and also join the community. This is something that's really important. Um, Medical devices take care of our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our friends. There are a lot of nuances in this community. We should be banding together to solve a lot of these challenges and avoid uh, the pitfalls that have happened in other industries that result in either uh, outcomes we don't like, delays to fixing this issue, and then also it's just a cool space to be in. Who here is having fun here at DEF CON, huh? You came to the simulation panel, didn't even know what it was. We had some fun. Can we give it up for our panelists, please?